Yes. If you have type 2 diabetes, Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on us the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us with great humility that in the last day when he shall come again with glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead we may rise to the life immortal through him who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, now and forever. Amen. Verse 5 of him, 411. He clothes thee with his love, upholds thee with his truth, and like the eagle he renews the vigor of thy youth. Well, we turn our attention to Bishop Christopher Wordsworth's Greece Pictorial Descriptive and Historical by Christopher Wordsworth, published in 1868. He was a canon at Westminster at the time. I've already got a picture, there's a lot of pictures here. Emperor Trajan making his will preface. The Emperor Hadrian possessed a magnificent villa at Tivoli, of which the ruins still remain. In it, he endeavored to perpetuate his own recollections of Greece. He there erected buildings to which he gave the names Pocule and Lyceum. By their side, he planted the grove of an academy, and he carried the stream of an ideal Peneus through the pleasant vale of an imitative Tempe. The traveler in Greece constructs in his own mind such a villa as this. He furnishes it with the beautiful scenes which he once visited in that country. He refreshes it with the clear waters and cool shades of the Tempe. But his recollections of Greece, like the buildings of Hadrian, are liable to fall into decay. The author of the following pages has therefore attempted to give a permanence to his own reminiscences by constructing a humbler Tivoli, in which he hopes that others may perhaps enjoy some share of that felt by the old Greek traveler in the villa of Hadrian. Such was the author's address by way of the preface to the original ed edition of his Greece in 1839. The publisher now has the pleasure of stating and in the period which has since elapsed, three large editions have been called for. The work has been translated into French and Italian languages. Okay, it's got some other comments here. London, 1858. And it's got a nice picture of a turtle on the beach with a ship off in the bay. Another picture of a mountain and a valley. Mount Parnassi. And if you've traveled around the world, this is just, if you haven't traveled, you know, I get it. You want to go see it, but it's got a ship on waves. Works illustrative of Greek geography. It's got a list of several writers. <clears throat> this a bibliography at the front. Another picture, the death of Socrates. Take Geographical features of Greece. Attica. 566 pages. Aegina, Athens. Uh, 
skipping the, uh, what was that? Focus, Lacris, and Moesha. Thessaly, Epirus, Arcania, Ionian Islands. I saw the islands are nice. Rhodes, Peloponnesus, Messenia, Sparta, Argolis, Corinth, huh? Yeah, and that's the end. And he's got another picture. And Axogorus at the door of the palace of Pericles. Is that right? Axagoras. Another picture of mountains with the wind waves crashing on it, steel plates. A listing of all the steel plates. Picture of a ruined aqueduct. Picture, another picture. I mean, I was dragged from the altar by order of Critian. List of the wood engravings. I mean, a lot of pictures here. Now, engravings on wood. Tons of those, so maybe we'll see how this goes. Um, if there's any verbal stuff going on. Or we're just screening it. It won't be useful if we're just, it's all pictures. Mo monument in Philo Paris. And there's the Parthenon up atop the hill. Athens restored. Characteristics of Greek art. When Pausanias traveled through Greece during the age of the Antonines about 1690 years ago, he found every city teeming with life and refinement. Every temple a museum of art and every spot hallowed by some tradition which contributed to its preservation. The ruthless destruction of these works of art in subsequent ages has reduced them to a small number, and the traveler now pauses with a melancholy interest to reflect upon the objects described by Pausanias, but which no longer exist. It is true that in our museums many fine monuments of ancient art have been preserved, their completeness and unity as works of art cannot be appreciated in all circumstances. In order to comprehend the design of the artist, the surrounding scenery to which it had reference, as well as the distance from which it was intended to be viewed or to be born in our mind. Where an object of art is removed from its original site, the scholar and the antiquary must be combined. With the artist and historian before the imagination can be carried back to the realities of a more classic period of its existence. It's therefore the object of these introductory passages to attempt the combination so necessary and important and thus to illustrate some of the more striking characteristics of the different eras of Greek art. <clears throat> Independently of the actual beauty and style of the execution, uh, in works of art, it is important to trace the historical period at which they were produced the process by which this information may be obtained is highly interesting and in most instances quite conclusive. The known locality of the city as described by ancient writers frequently affords sufficient evidence to identify its ruins. The sculptured decorations which formed a part of its buildings 
may also be historically associated with it. In this way, the date of their execution can sometimes be ascertained, but unfortunately, few Greek edifices remain which have their sculptures thus connected with them. With the exception of the Parthenon, a temple of Theseus in Athens, a temple of Minerva in Aegina, and those of Olympia in Elis and Figalia in Arcadia, all of which contain sculpture more important toward a history of art. Few other instances are known where the identity is perfect. In many instances, a new temple has been erected on the site of a former one. Portions of the ancient foundation having been left for the old materials frequently used for the new structure. Bas reliefs and inscriptions have been built into plain walls with sculptured sides turned inwards as at Nineveh and Xanthus, where the bas reliefs were only discovered on the de demolition of the walls by which they had thus been protected. As guides to the different eras of art, coins from having inscriptions on them are also of great importance. They are generally impressed with a portrait of the existing ruler or with the religious emblems of the town in which they were struck. They frequently bear allusion to some circumstance, the date of which is well known. In early times, coins bore the symbol of the presiding divinity of the city, and the issue of money was regulated by the priests as a matter of religious care. We may therefore assume that, that the first talent within reach was employed in their execution. Monarchs subsequently introduced their own fancies upon the coinage, at first under the semblance of divinity, but at length they represented themselves with all their personal characteristics and their usual insignia of power. It was also customary to introduce upon coins reduced copies of the most celebrated works of art, especially statuary, thus furnishing transcripts of many fine groups, such as the Venus of Nidus, Venus of Kos, the reposing Hercules, works have, which have since perished, being smaller in size and of a material not easily broken, and moreover being of metal impervious to rust. Many specimens of bronze coins have come down to us as perfect as when they were first produced. We are thus enabled to judge accurately of the beauty and delicacy of their execution. Many of our finest bronze medals have been preserved by a peculiarly hard co coating term patna, which forms over the metal in the earth like a varnish upon the surface. And this being harder than the metal itself has served the better to protect it. Iron, on the contrary, is destroyed by the rust which forms upon it, a fact which accounts for the entire disappearance of many useful implements which are, the Greeks are known to have possessed. Besides this enduring nature of the material of which coins were formed, other circumstances have tended considerably to their preservation. The practice of hoarding money by burying it in earthen jars was common in ancient times the owner seldom communicating to anyone the place of its concealment in the event of his violent or sudden death a secret would thus perish with him history affords many instances of men becoming suddenly rich by the discovery of some hidden treasure this is said to have been the case with herodas and Timon of Athens, and many similar hordes have been laid open in our own day. It was formerly a custom also to bury money 
with the dead and the coin which was intended to pay the ferryman over the sticks. Has in more than one instance been found adhering to the jawbone of the dead body. Very early times, tombs called Hupogea were constructed beneath the level of the ground, which from this circumstance were more likely to escape desecration. Other tombs were also built of a more conspicuous form, serving for monumental purposes and displaying fine architectural conceptions. These, as well as Hypogea, contain, besides the remains of the deceased, articles of great value, such as vases, bronze and gold ornaments, and even domestic utensils. For the ancients paid great respect to the dead and frequently buried them with all the articles they valued most during life. Tombs of distinguished persons were also protected by inscriptions engraved on the portal, imprecating curses upon anyone venturing to disturb them. These inscriptions seem to have been effectual at early ages, for many such monuments have remained buried in the accumulated soil <clears throat> and have only been brought to light in our days. During the latter period, all the tombs which offered any temptation to plunder were rifled by the Romans, especially during the time of Theodoric, when the plunder seems to have been carried on systematically. In more recent times, the values of articles found in these tombs has been so great as to encourage a regular system of excavation which has been attended with successful results at Athens, Milo, Corinth, and various parts of Italy, where some of the finest painted vases and ornaments have been found in connection with funerial, funerial structures. These vases and golden wreaths and other decorations found with them were probably trophies of victories in the public games. The custom of writing the name over the principal figures in the early vases has been serviceable in interpreting the subject of, of the painting. A uniform style of costume and personal appearance has been adopted in the representation of particular individuals, which enables the initiated to trace with some certainty the intention of the artist. In early sculptures of whole heroic subjects, the names were also engraved upon them. Again, portraits, statutes, and busts of individuals often bore their names, which means the artist has become familiar with the physiognomy of the statesmen and philosophers of ancient times. Historians have also left us some account of the changes which have taken place in art, recording the name of the artist as well as the period at which such changes occurred. Pliny occasionally names artists who introduce new modes of treatment, but he's more careful in enumerating their works <clears throat> in his writings. Thus offer us little more than a catalog of names. Quintilian, Lucian, and Pausanias give more particular descriptions of their works from these authors. It is discovered that we are in possession of copies, or imitations at least, of some of the great works of former ages, whose destruction is certain. Historians also assist us in the study of ancient writing. From them we learn the period at which certain letters were introduced, and when one of these letters appears on a monument, we are certain that its date is posterior to the period of the introduction of that form of letter. 
the same changes extend to the spelling of words. In the Middle Ages, when art degenerated into an hereditary trade, we find the very worst specimens employed upon public monuments. It would seem that the exclusive privilege of employment was bestowed as a personal favor upon certain individuals, irrespective altogether of their capacity. During this period, many of the monuments of private individuals display more originality and refinement than the embellishments employed in public trophies or the arches of emperors themselves. We now close our general remarks and proceed at once to point out in detail the progressive stages of art from the rudest phase to its most refined development both in what are generally termed the works of the artist and in those of the artisan. Whatever may have been of the origin of the Greek nation, which like most others is lost in the dark recesses of time, whether the Hellenic or Pelasgic element prevailed at the outset of its career, it is of little moment to our immediate purpose. We are content to repeat the traditions recorded by one of the earliest Greek poets, which were commonly received as truth in his day, Aeschylus, Prometheus, the Hellenes, according to this authority, preserved many traditions respecting their earliest state which represented them to have been on a level with the savage tribes we now find wandering in the extensive forests and wilds of America. Good morning. Good morning. They then had no agriculture, but lived on the spontaneous produce of the woods. And at that period, not even fire could be appropriated to the service of man till it had been stolen, as Aeschylus tells us, from heaven. In primitive times, the construction of human habitations acquired the distinctive title of chief art, and hence the Greek word architectonia. Architectonia. Architecture. Next, in order to this chief art, may be ranked sculpture, originating in the use of clay for the formation of bricks and the construction of vessels for domestic purposes. Sculpture, probably so-called, however, could not exist until after the introduction of tools by which marble and other hard material could be fashioned. Painting is of much more recent date although it is probable that in very remote times, color was employed as a dye. It may fairly be assumed, then, that the early Greek, in his habitation, accommodated himself, like other primitive races, to the rude shelter afforded by caverns and hollow trees, and that as the race increased and wants multiplied, constructed habitations were attempted first consisting of a mere roof composed of bows and skins spread from tree to tree and serving as a protection against inclement weather. Primitive shelter of this kind may still be seen in some of the less frequented parts of Asia Minor, trunks of trees supporting a mass of interwoven bows hung with the skins of beasts of the chase keep off the wind it shows a picture here of a primitive shelter keep off the wind and form a temporary refuge the primitive temple of apollo at delphi as pausanias informs us resembled a hut or cabin and was composed of laurel trees it's got a mud hut here in the course of time, buildings became more permanent. Mud was added to the material 
of which the roof was formed, and the sides strengthened with clay. The trees forming the props were cleared of all lateral branches, and they were mounted on pieces of stone to prevent their rotting from contact with the earth. At this stage, the structure began to assume the character of a complete building. I think it's here that we'll draw this segment to a close. Very interesting. History of architecture. And for some reason, I knocked off these two hymns. Jumped to hymn 414. God, my King. Thy might confessing, ever will I bless thy name. Day by day thy throne addressing, still will I thy praise proclaim. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.